happy to do that, Bill. Thanks again for the opportunity. We appreciate it. I, I'll be fairly brief on the front end, and then I'll pass it over to Alex next. Uh, you know, in many ways, the, the, the seed of this idea came, came from Alex. Uh, and um, the reason, I, or one of the reasons, several reasons I think it's, it's related to, to your cloud expertise is, you know, how do you, how do you scale a narrative? If you started at the 30,000 foot level, you know, what is a narrative? How do you scale it? How do you create narratives for an institution that is, is as wide and complex as, as UC Berkeley? Lots of people that are closer to this than I am are describing society increasingly as a competition between narratives. It's not just who has the better facts. You really need a richer story to capture people. Uh, whether capturing people means getting people to apply and come to Berkeley or, or faculty and staff staying at Berkeley or whatever it is. Having a narrative that people want to be part of is absolutely fundamental. So this narrative that we're going to be talking about today that, that all of your cloud expertise can, can help us scale is this idea of the Berkeley change maker. And you know, so, so what's behind it? We'll talk a little bit about the curriculum. Um, Alex was, as I said, really the starting point on this. He, he created a class called Becoming a Change Maker. Uh, it was taught widely to undergraduates. Uh, I'll call it a pilot version. We weren't thinking of scaling it at the time, but he taught a version in 2019 that received an average instructor, or sorry, an average course rating of 6.7 out of seven. It was just hugely successful. 17 different majors, students saying it totally changed the way I think about my life and the way I wanna live my life. It was just remarkable. Um, now that's one course, fit roughly 50 people. And then the idea is, huh, change maker. Suppose, suppose you did this, I call it the lineup test. Change maker or change making as a narrative. Princeton, change maker. Harvard, change maker. MIT, change maker. Stanford, obviously very innovative place. Stanford, change maker. Berkeley, change maker. People who aren't even alums of Berkeley would pick Berkeley out of that lineup. And it's, it's in our history, it's in our DNA as, as a university. And so what would a campus-wide change maker narrative look like? And you could have a lot of exemplars, right? If you're thinking about, an, uh, there, there are 50 people we could name immediately. Um, that, that we, you know, a, a, a Bill Joy or, a, or an Alice Waters or a Maxine Hong Kingston or, um, if you're into physics, Barry Barish, gravitational waves, you, you, the list goes on and on and on. But um, so how do we scale, not just Alex's class, which he will talk about and I'll pass it on to him, but what if it's an experience that every incoming freshman and transfer student has a course? What if it's a curriculum that they could follow? What if there is a C school at Berkeley, a change school? What would this narrative look like? How, how could we change admissions? How could this content get delivered to staff and faculty? How big could this narrative get? I'm gonna stop here, but scaling the, an already great idea in Alex's course to a narrative that, that can become identity making for Berkeley, that's what's on the table. Alex, I pass it over to you. Thanks, Rich. Hard to live up to a Rich Lyons intro, but I'll, I'll do my best. So happy to be here. Thanks for all of you coming out. Uh, so becoming a change maker, it's now a couple semesters underway and it's the most fun I've ever had teaching and um, it's an amazing opportunity to teach these Berkeley students, these Berkeley change makers. Uh, and at its core, change making as we think about it is helping students to identify and get inspired to solve meaningful problems and then have that willingness to take action on it. So the course I teach at Haas of course has a strong leadership lens to it. Talk a lot about a change maker mindset talk about traits and attributes that you need to lead positive change, whether that's resilience, adaptability, thriving in highly dynamic environments, seeing opportunity and challenge, uh, all of which, by the way, are quite applicable uh, in the state of the world today. Um, as we turn towards this summer class, as Rich said, you know, it's a chance to welcome these students to Berkeley, get them excited about their Berkeley experience, give them a bit of a roadmap as they think about their next four years as Berkeley students, their future as Berkeley alumni, and to gear them up ready to go to lead positive change from the first moment they set foot on campus. As we look to scale this, of course, that means we're going digital, digital from day one. 
And so it'll be a three-week course that we're teaching, late July to mid-August. It'll be two units and pass, no pass. And we're really trying to not just take this course that already exists and sort of shoehorn and force it into this structure, but rather to say, okay, we've got three weeks, we've got digital tools, which Sarah from Haas Digital will talk more about. How do we make the most out of this opportunity? How do we uh, engineer this class to be inspiring and engaging and give students the background they need as a Berkeley change maker? A few things that we're really thinking about in terms of the content and the curriculum on the course, um, three C's, so critical thinking, how to select and frame a problem, how to ask the right questions, how to craft a strong approach or a solution, communicating, and collaborating. We think these are key skills, 21st century leadership skills that everyone needs. We'll start off by helping students see themselves as a Berkeley change maker. So we'll do some leadership work, some identity work. Uh, we'll talk about change making as questioning, talk about change making together. So we'll bring in uh, experts on teaming. We'll talk about diversity, equity, inclusion as a powerful lens towards being able to work together. Uh, and then change making and practice. The idea is they don't just develop this mindset and these skills, but that these students feel inspired and enabled to apply them, to do meaningful things with them. So I'm, of course, part of the class. We also have an amazing team who's teaching it alongside me. Um, and thanks to uh, Laura Hassner's amazing work, we've got a whole bunch of faculty from across campus, uh, Distinguished Teaching Award winners representing all kinds of fields, all kinds of disciplines, and they'll be sharing their own perspectives. So, of course, I bring my bias, I bring my Haas hat, but we'll also have people representing physics and dance, talking about what does it mean to be a change maker in their field? What does collaboration look like in dance? What does it mean to have resilience as a physicist? Uh, so we hope that all together this gives students a really exciting identity-making experience before they even come to Berkeley, and then we can set them up on a path to become Berkeley change makers for their four years and beyond. So that's a bit on the curriculum. Let me turn it over now to Sarah to talk about how we're actually doing this, the digital tools to make it a reality. Yes, thanks, Alex. Um, so at Haas Digital, we design a number of online courses. A lot of them have been focused mostly in executive education. So we're applying some of the best principles that we've had from designing those courses to this particular course, because this is students' first introduction to Berkeley. We want it to be a very positive one, but we understand that we're gonna be dealing with large enrollment numbers in the online space. And we know from the research that MOOCs generally don't work. If you put a lot of students in a class and just kind of let them go completely asynchronously uh, without any high touch points, um, the completion rates are really quite low. Um, from MOOCs, there was an emergence of, uh, we're calling them SPOCs now, small personalized online classes. So we're taking the best principles of that and applying it to this course. So a lot of the same instructional design that we do for everything. We look at the in-person class, we say, what would be best facilitated through asynchronous video? We've broken that down into two different types. Um, we have kind of our traditional green screen lecture video, and then we have our fireside chats, which are more of a conversation um, because of the current situation, uh, we've had to be change makers ourselves and are thinking of uh, an approach to, we're calling it our studio in a box, which is essentially a green screen kit that we're going to be mailing to faculty. So we can remotely record them and make sure that um, we're capturing everything at a high enough resolution, good enough audio quality that we can still go back and do our traditional post-production techniques and maintain kind of 80 to 90% um, fidelity of the video content. So that's gonna be an interesting challenge for us, but um, we're watching a lot of John Oliver and seeing kind of how they're doing it. So we can know that, um, you know, there are uh, lots of good resources out there that we can look to to make sure that we're replicating that. From there, we really look at what do the touch points need to be with students before they go into different experiences? So what can we design into B courses, which allows them to watch the video content and then complete small exercises that are self-reflection based or um, do just a little bit more written collaboration with their peers through my means of a discussion board. We're incorporating a number of tools um, like ARC and um, CN Post, which is a discussion thread tool, which allow them to have um, that more uh, asynchronous discussion, um, but we're also incorporating some video tools which encourage them to um, speak with each other and then also um, uh, collaborate, um, show their negotiation skills, show their influence skills, um, focus on their public speaking um, using tools just like this over Zoom. Um, and then for coming together in those group sessions, those office hours as it were, really um, making that time be very valuable 
for um, the students to come. We've broken them into smaller cohorts to make sure that everyone gets a chance to talk. So um, within a class of about 150, the magic number tends to be about 30 a piece. Um, and then uh, Laura and Alex and um, other uh, you know, learning facilitators, GSIs, whatever you'd like to call them, um, will be facilitating greater discussions. The idea is the students have prepared ahead of time, they've seen the video content, they've had some time to debrief with their peers, and now they get to come and ask very pointed questions and treat it as a very um, deliberate lecture and really synthesize those important topics um, in a synchronous forum. Um, and we realized that uh, Alex's course has a lot of content in it, so we've really tried to distill it down to um, the meat and really structure those activities in a way which will allow students to be successful and pace themselves in um, you know, a very responsible way to make sure that they're getting about you know, 10 hours of contact time plus 20 hours of um, additional uh, self-paced work on their own. And um, I, we think uh, it's gonna be a really great uh, experience, even though we have to do it among a slightly different environment than what we were expecting. But um, yeah, it's, it's been really fun to take on this project and we're really looking forward to seeing the finished product. So um, I will pass it to Laura, if Laura has any other uh, comments on uh, that process. Great. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to everyone. I can see many more smiling faces now, so thank you for joining us. Um, I just wanted to tie everything together from our presentation and talk a little bit about the unique challenges of COVID-19. Um, as you uh, understood, uh, this is a summer course um, targeted towards incoming Cal students. So we have the opportunity by teaching it remotely um, and online to reach students where they are literally, as in their homes or anywhere in the globe. Um, and uh, that makes it an extraordinary opportunity for us, uh, but also a challenge as we think that the contributing faculty members who will be um, highlighted in this course are located also across the globe. Um, we have 15 different departments uh, represented in the faculty. We have eight distinguished teaching award winners and six schools and colleges across UC Berkeley being represented. Um, so one of the challenges that Sarah and her team are helping us to troubleshoot is how do we conduct an interview of these faculty members um, given that we can't be in the same room and how do we ensure that they have high quality uh, video editing uh, video um, capabilities and so on in their own homes. Uh, so just a little bit of excitement um, and we have a couple of questions for the audience um, so I encourage you uh, to uh, add the chat box or um, however Bill might like to facilitate that um, but there were two questions we were hoping you could all help us to answer. The first is how do what are the best strategies for reaching incoming Berkeley students in this time of social distancing? And the second question is what cloud tools should we consider to make the most of teaching this course and building community among students who will be remotely. So I'll repeat those questions again. Uh, the first is how do we best reach our incoming students in the time of social distancing? And the second, what cloud tools should we consider to make the most of teaching this course and building community among students remotely? So let's start with the first question. Um, any suggestions from our audience, please, and how to best reach our incoming students in the time of social distancing? And I'll just start taking notes. I unmuted everybody, um, but also feel free to use the chat. I see a comment from Jen about social media. Any suggestions about social media outlets? Instagram. Thank you. Patrick, it looks like you have the floor. All right, so I, because there was a lot of background noise and it was unclear, I muted everybody, but you have the ability to unmute. 
So if you want to say something, unmute or you can raise your hand and we will figure out how to, how to find you with the hand up. Put them on the spot. Hello. Hi, Laura. Yes. Uh, I, I, I can, uh, I would just want to suggest that since these students, uh, these, these incoming students are already communicating with the school already, uh, that this, uh, whatever uh, additional information they need to get needs to go to, the, we just integrate the, uh, the communication along that uh, channel uh, because they are already communicating with the student to, through the admission office and uh, maybe it should be incorporated into that so that they can get a package that uh, they will be prepared actually uh, knowing that this part of the admission process now uh, coming to Becky. Yes, yes, integrating into the admissions process. Thank you. I will suggest Google. The group cool. platform. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to contribute? This is Jen. Hi. Um, you know, I was also I was looking at the teaching high schools directly. You know, I have two children who are both adult children who are both teachers, and they're teaching middle school right now online. And it does seem to me that there is an amazing opportunity right now to connect with, with teachers who are teaching students online in a way that would actually build our pipeline of, um, of both undergraduate and graduate students when you think about it in that way. Anyway, I'm just, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but it's an amazing opportunity as they're learning the techniques and tools that you have more um, facility with, um, that there may be a way to actually build that pipeline both for um, you know future teachers in other spaces, but also in our undergraduate and graduate populations. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, I, if I can jump in there, thanks. I love that idea, and you know we'll make it available to you. In fact, we'll send around the um, the syllabus for this this summer course. It's still evolving a bit, but we'd ha happy to send it to all of you. But with the idea that if you wanted to send it along to, to a high school teacher that you know, right? Building the pipeline, here's something exciting going on at Berkeley. I think the more virally we can get that message out with real content like a syllabus, um, that, that's, a, that's a great idea. We hadn't thought of that, thank you. Thank you very much and to everyone who keeps them coming in the group chat. I recognize that we have an agenda to move through. So if we could move to the second question and we'll capture your, um, all, all of your ideas in writing on the chat. Um, what cloud tools, you all are the expert, uh, should we consider to make the most of teaching this course? And to, that can help us to also build a sense of community among students who not only um, will be remotely at the time, but will have been remote for a significant period of time thanks to the shelter in place. Alex just posted it, uh, the question in writing as well. Thanks, Alex. You know, there's a uniquely Berkeley uh, online platform which is used to teach uh, Data 8 and Data 100, namely the Data Hub. Yes. And there are, there are private sector and, and other community-based uh, versions of that. And it seems to me that this is, that look, Data 8 is basically taught online. Uh, there are many other courses that could be taught this way, and this is a resource that goes well beyond Google Classroom, Zoom, and Rich, to your point about being a change maker, this was invented right here. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, this... yeah I mean, I, I, sorry to jump in, but I think that idea of a platform that is associated, you know, identified with the course, and to use Laura's word, with the community, right? If people are alumni of this course, start to think of themselves as sort of being bound together in something larger. Uh, I think having a platform along the lines of what you suggest could, could, could be really valuable for building a sense of community or, or affiliation. One thing that we've tried to do with the Cloud Meetup also is um, try to make the content at a moment in time, so there's a live experience, but also keep the content around 
and allow it to be sort of hacked on and all of each individual talk is recorded and chopped in, into a YouTube video and uh, and links to people's slides. And, and so that remains out there and people can repurpose it and use it under the, you know, Creative Commons type scenario. And so maybe that also sort of applies in this case to just unexpected ways of people engaging with it. Thank you. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, one other, when we reached out to Janet Yellen, who was on our faculty for 30 years, um, she said, I'd be happy to contribute some content. So she's going to be doing an interview and right. Imagine 30 seconds of Janet Yellen being able to toss that out in various ways. Carol, Carol Christ has also said that she's happy to do an interview specifically to develop content for this course. So there, there are going to be some wonderful snippets of content that we can use exactly that way, Bill. Well, Thank you fantastic. so much for your feedback. I see that we're at 5.30, Bill, so I'll yield the microphone back to you, but please keep those comments coming. We really appreciate this opportunity to get your insight, wisdom, and advice. And we'll, we'll get you the syllabus. Thank you. Well, and when we get that material, we'll post it on uh, the web along with the um, reference to this meetup and Great. your presentation. Thank you so much. So.